scripture we ever taught each of our daughters was 1 John 4.19. We love him because... God, because, wow, we're exceptional people. We love him because he's exceptional God. And that evokes the right kind of response from us. That we ought to, how can you do anything but love him? Think about that. Um, I, was t- I was out to lunch with a pastor friend of mine a couple weeks ago, Pastor Dave Goforth. He's down in South Carolina. And it's just he and I for lunch. And uh, he said, you know, brother, the longer I pastor, he said, I wonder how many of our people just sit around and talk about how much they love the Lord? You know, we'll get together and we'll talk about really enjoy being at church or we talk about the weather. You know, we talk about things we mutually enjoy. Or the, he said, but how many of us just talk about how much we love God? And, and he and I both have that conversation a lot. Uh, I would love, if, if anything was put on my tombstone, you know, I'm, I've been an evangelist for 31 years. Well, that's probably the thing most people would, would know about my life. But the most important thing to me would be, That guy loved Jesus Christ. What's more important? Nothing is more important. We're going to talk about him tonight in John 15. I didn't plan this week that we'd be in John for the first couple of days together, but that's where we've been, and so let's go back to John again. We're kind of working our way through. We were giving an overview of the book of John yesterday, then we were in John 14 last night, now we're in John 15. My text is going to be from uh, verses 1 to 8 tonight. Do you remember hearing about the three R's when you were in school? Okay, what were the three R's? Reading, writing, arithmetic. Now, the funny thing is only one of those is actually an R. <laughs> reading. <laughs> writing. Now, how do you spell writing? You know, W-R-I-T-I-N-G, right? And how about arithmetic? <laughs> Starts with an A, right? The three R's. It's funny. My dad uh, had... Spent all his life in South Jersey and was a general contractor, but he started getting burdened about maybe being a pastor. He wasn't sure if God wanted him to be a pastor, but he was teaching our adult Sunday school, loved it. And so in 1988, I was going into my senior year of college down at Pensacola Christian, and my dad decided to go to move the whole family down to Pensacola, and he enrolled in Bible. Uh, he was getting a master's degree. He earned his, his, uh, earned his bachelor's at Rutgers. But then he, he went on down to get a Bible degree at Pensacola. And I remember um, my dad and I were in some classes together, even though he was a master's level class. And so we would come home and we'd talk about it. And one day he's really struggling. He said, oh, Rich, I need you to pray for me. And I said, what are you struggling with, Dad? Can I help you? He's like, well, it's the three R's. And I thought, three, well, we got a problem, the three R's. I said, reading, writing, arithmetic? He said, no, recall, recollection, and remembrance. I just can't remember anything. Well, you know, if you're getting tests and stuff, uh, reading, uh, recall, recollection, and remembrance would be really important, wouldn't it? We talk about the three R's because they're foundational to education. In fact, I don't know if you've noticed, uh, I think a lot of people have awakened to the fact that so much of our educational system is not focusing on the basics. And our kids are the worse off for it. So if, you know, a lot of people that homeschool their kids or they put them in a private or a Christian school, they, they want those kids to get the foundations, reading, writing, arithmetic. It's so important. And that's why in school you go through those same subjects over and over again, different level, higher level each year, but you've got to get them ingrained in your mind. Well, spiritually, we're going to talk about the three R's tonight, the three R's of abiding in Christ. So that's where we're going, three R's of abiding in Christ, and it's in John 15, 1 through 8 really is foundational truth to live in the Christian life. And yet, i got to tell you, I don't hear a whole lot of preaching on the matter of abiding in Him. Let me read from John 15. And I will give you a little background as I go to this passage. I probably, uh, maybe 20 years ago, I was out in California at a church I preached in every year, Fundamental Baptist Church, it's called of uh, Escondido, California. And I would do an annual tent meeting there for the whole family and so a lot of these kids in the church had heard me from the time they were little. I was there 19 straight years of meetings. And one time this, this homeschool kid came up and he said, hey, could I do an interview with you? I'm supposed to interview a missionary or an evangelist. And I said, sure. He said, well, I'm going to give you a little uh, sheet ahead of time of some questions I might ask so you're prepared. I thought, well, this kid's sharp, right? And so there were several on there. But one really grabbed my attention. His question was, what is your favorite chapter of the Bible? I'd never thought about that, you know, and he probably figured an evangelist would say John 3, but, you know, I thought, favorite chapter, man, I'd be hard-pressed to, what's my favorite book, but uh, 
So I began to think, okay, I can't just tell this high school kid, well, they're all good. You know, that's not what he's looking to hear. Uh, so he's wanting some thought put into it. I thought, all right, if, you know, gun to head kind of moment, if I had to say, what is my favorite chapter of the Bible, what would it be? And as I pondered it that week, I, I thought, well, you know, I could make a good case for John 15 being my favorite chapter. You might say, how did you come to that conclusion? Well, let me read the first eight verses, and I'll show you why. I kind of zeroed in on John 15. John 15, beginning in verse 1. Now, the Lord Jesus is the one speaking here. He says this, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Now, that's a term for a farmer, you know, the vineyard keeper. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that I may bring forth more fruit. Now you're clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I am you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I'm the vine. You're the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Now you probably notice the term fruit there. In fact, he goes from talking about bearing fruit in verse 2 to more fruit at the end of verse 2, to much fruit in verse 5, and then again in verse 8. That's the progression. So fruit, more fruit, much fruit. I think about that being analogous to Jesus' parable, the sower, we're on the good ground. You remember some brought forth 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. So there's fruit, there's more fruit, there's much fruit. This morning in my personal quiet time, I'm reading a book called uh, Charting the End Times. Uh, Tim LaHaye co-authored the book. And it's, it's an overview of the end times. And today I was studying the topic of the uh, judgment seat of Christ. And he's talking about every one of us is going to give account to the Lord for how we lived our life. And that's going to determine usefulness in the millennial kingdom. And, um, you know, there are different crowns you can wear. I've, I've studied that before, but, man, it was, a, it was a fresh reminder. Every day I'm living my life right now is preparing me for usefulness in forever. Now, my... My going to heaven is not dependent upon anything I've done. It's totally on what Jesus Christ did for me. But once I'm saved, now what kind of treasure am I laying up in heaven? And that depends on going from fruit to more fruit to much fruit. And I thought, I don't want to spend my whole life as a 30-fold Christian or even a 60-fold Christian. I, I really would like God to do a work in me that I'm a 100-fold Christian. Well, how do you get there? Abiding in Him. And Pastor mentioned last night when Jesus talked about the greater works, he said, you'll do greater works. How was that possible? It was Acts 1.8. Ye shall receive power, dunamis, the word from which is derived dynamite. You'll receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Remember, the Spirit of God would come into the heart of man who's saved, and the Spirit of God would produce the power. The Spirit of God would bear the fruit. So that's what he moves from talking in chapter 14 about greater works. How's that possible? Abiding in him. So I'm going to break it down. Now, interesting, normally when you study a passage of Scripture, the normal way is we'll just work our way through verses 1 to 8, and we'll go consecutively. But in the three R's, I want you to start with this. The first R is the word remain, and that's going to take us to the middle section of what we just read, really, literally, the heart of the passage. So remain, and I want you to notice here specifically verses 4 and 5. Verse 4, abide in me. And I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. In fact, let me pick up 6 and 7 as well. If a man abide not in me, he's cast forth as a branch and is withered. Men gather them and cast them into the fire. They're burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Okay, so... I went out and I, I picked a sprig off of the, the mum out front by the church sign. And, you know, mums are in, in bloom right now, and uh, some of our friends in South Jersey, they sell tens of thousands of mums every year. And so if, if you're in uh, landscaping or, you know, you've got a greenhouse, boy, mums are the thing right now. Now, think about this. I, I broke this little sprig off that chrysanthemum. What, what is the mum going to look like about a week from now? This one here. Yeah, a mummy. <laughs> da, da, da. Super. That's like a dad joke, and it wasn't even told by a dad. 
Yeah, that's right. It's going to be withered up. It's going to be shriveled up. Because once you cut it off from the plant, photosynthesis isn't working anymore. You know, normally you have the nutrients running through the plant to keep the plant alive. But now it's broken off. This poor thing is not going to look like this tomorrow. It's going to look worse the next day. And the idea is it's got to be attached to the plant, to the stem, if it's going to flourish. Okay, now interesting. What does the word abide mean? So this week I, um, I'm abiding in, well, actually in Princeton, your property, you know, a little ways from here. So I'm, I'm technically abiding in Princeton this week, staying in one of the houses that the church owns. Okay, so I moved in. I literally, there's a dresser in there. I, I unpacked all my socks, T-shirts, everything, put it in there, hung up all my clothes, ironed them all. I mean, I literally moved in. What, what does the word abide mean? Any ideas? Simple ideas of the word abide? To remain, to, to dwell, to move in. Okay, that's the whole idea. Remain, abide, dwell. It has to do with a constancy of presence. And think about this. The Lord says, if you abide in me. It comes from the, the word meno in Greek. And it has to do with this uh, constancy of fellowship. It's a, to stay in a certain place. Uh, to continue. To be present. Not to depart. So when you, when you dwell somewhere, it's not like you just came, had a meal, and left. No, you've literally moved in. Interesting. I remember as a kid reading the little parable, uh, My Heart, Christ Home. Did any of you ever read that little story, My Heart, Christ Home? It's an interesting one. You ought to look it up. And uh, I didn't think about bringing it with me tonight, but it's about this guy who talks about Jesus moving into his house. And boy, he was thrilled to have the Lord living there. But there were certain closets in his house he didn't want the Lord touching. You know, that was his thing. And as the Lord's spending more and more time with the individual, Eventually, he says, okay, we need to deal with this over here. It's like, oh, that, that's my stuff. He's like, if I'm going to stay here in fellowship with you, then these things are going to need to go. And as he was growing in grace, there was more of a weaning that was going on, more of a purging that was going on. That's really insightful. And you think about this. If Jesus Christ moved into your house, what would you be happy for him to see? And what might you be ashamed for him to see? And you know, he knows everything. So let's delve into this word remain again, or abide here. It's the idea to stay in a given place, or to remain in a relationship, to continue, to be present. Okay, so again, look at verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except you abide in me. All right, you remember... Um, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things, how? Through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Well, notice the contrast in verse 5. He says, I am the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me, I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. So Philippians 4.13 says, through him you can do all things, but without him you can do nothing. Not a, you can't do a thing without the Lord. Okay, so what does this whole concept of abiding mean? Mark your place here. Let's jump over to uh, 1 John, another book written by the Apostle John, 1 John. And I want you to notice uh, the first few verses of chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. In fact, for sake of time, let me, uh, let, me, let me read verse 1 and then I'll jump ahead. Verse 1 is, That which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon, our hands have handled, of the word of life, Notice capital W, Word of Life. Remember, John is the only one that uses that term for the Lord. Okay, notice he opens up this little book by saying that which was from the beginning. He had written the previous book called the Gospel of John, which opened with the words, in the beginning was the Word. So he hails back to that, says that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, we've seen with our eyes, we've looked upon, our hands have handled of the Word of Life. In other words, he says, look, I saw Jesus with my own eyes. I, I put my arms around him. I remember he was the one that leaned on Jesus' bosom on his breast at the uh, Last Supper. I mean, John had a very close personal relationship with the Lord. He was literally a, a companion, a, a uh, what would you call, a uh, in the inner circle of the Lord would be a good way to describe it. Remember there were Peter and James and John. They were all in the inner circle of the 12. 
So he's literally part of that inner circle. All right, jump down to verse 6. We'll save some time here. If we say we have fellowship with him, we walk in darkness. And lie, uh, we lie and do not, th- I'm sorry, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Notice from verse 6 to verse 10, there are a whole bunch of if we statements. If we say that, if we walk in, if we say that, if we confess, if we say that. Okay, so there are a whole bunch of if we's. All right. You say, oh, yeah, I have fellowship with God. He says, if something's happening in your life, but you claim you have fellowship with God, well, then your claim is not true. So he says, if you claim you have fellowship with God, but you're doing something, you don't have fellowship with God. What's the thing? He says, if you're doing this, you don't have fellowship with God. What is it according to the Bible? Sin. Yeah, you got sin in your life. I remember I had a Bible teacher when I was in uh, high school, and he was, he was phenomenal. He was a just a, an encyclopedia of the Bible. You could quote any verse from the Bible, and he'd tell you the chapter and reference for it in the, in the New Testament, any New Testament passage. And we tried to stump him, man, and he could, he could name them all. Unbelievable. And uh, he had this dynamic way of presenting truth. And I remember one time we're talking about 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. I'm going to talk about that in more depth in a minute. But I remember him making a statement. He said, look, gang, when it comes to sin... He said, it's it's unconfessed sin that keeps us from fellowship with God. And sometimes you and I have been out of fellowship with God all day, like we lose our temper and we say something we shouldn't have said, and maybe you say a bad word or maybe you say an unkind thing or you already feel defeated. And later on in the day, you act in a very selfish way. And then maybe your parents tell you to do something and you just directly disobey. And he said, later on, you maybe you have a bad thought or you, you have a moment of an angry outburst or whatever. And he said, it's like a spiral. Just You're, you're going down and down. And you, you got out of fellowship a long time ago, and it's just getting worse. He said, listen, when it comes to sins, you got to fess them when you do them. Don't group them. <laughs> All right. Now, I've never forgotten that. Fess them when you do them. Don't group them. What did he mean? Too often we just let sin accumulate and we've been out of fellowship with God for hours. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But too often we have not confessed. Now I'm going to get back, I'm going to get into that definition of confess a little bit more in in a few minutes. But suffice it to say, it's sin that severs our fellowship with him. So what does it mean to abide in him? That doesn't mean that you can lose your salvation. Okay, let me take you to um, Romans chapter 8. Let's work our way backward. Go to Romans chapter 8, and I want you to see, uh, I think for sake of time, we'll pick up in verse 31. And boy, from 31 to 39 is incredible about the believer's eternal security. Okay, we're talking about remaining in him. We're not talking about the possibility of losing your salvation. There are some people, I, I feel bad for them. They've grown up in a theology where they feel like anytime they've, they've committed some serious sin, they've lost their salvation. And they've got to, quote, get saved all over again. Well, what happens if, you know, the night before the rapture comes, you got in some bad sin and you forgot to confess it and the Lord comes? Are you left behind? What happens if, you know, the night before you die, you got in some sin and you didn't get re-saved and then you die? Are you, are you going to hell? Boy, that's a, that's a really difficult theology to live with. The fact is, you don't have to live with that theology because it's not Bible. Let me show you why I say that. Well, it's because you're a Baptist. No, no, I didn't grow up Baptist. I became a Baptist by conviction. But I didn't believe in eternal security because that's a Baptist thing. It's a Bible thing. Let me show you Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. What should we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It's Christ that died, yea, rather that's risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. In other words, who's going to lay an accusation against you? You're not getting to heaven based on how good you were. 
You're getting to heaven based on how good Jesus Christ is. And who's going to lay any charge of wrongdoing against Christ? No one. Well, he's the one who died. And he was the one who was crucified. He's the one whose blood was shed. And he rose again. And so therefore, verse 35 asks this, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? In other words, when you're really going through tough, tough times, you may feel like God has abandoned you, but has he abandoned you? No. Or distress. Uh, the root of the word distress is stress. Have you ever felt stressed in your life? Some of you are thinking, have I ever not felt stressed in my life? Okay, is distress going to separate you from him? Or persecution. Hey, have people ever mocked you or maybe excluded you from their circle because of your faith? Persecution. Or famine. Man, I don't know. I've gone through a time. I don't feel like God's meeting all my needs right now. Does that mean God's turned his back on you? Or, or nakedness. I don't, have enough, I don't have enough clothes to put on my back. Or the kids are, man, I feel like my needs aren't being met. Or peril. Times of danger. You know, like right now I was praying about this storm coming to Florida. And uh, I, I, was, I was very having a transparent conversation with the Lord today. Father, I've talked to you about this many times. We live in Kansas City, and tornadoes are common out there, you know. So many, many times I've had this conversation. I've said, Lord, I live in a fifth-wheel trailer. I am a sitting duck. If, if you don't protect me, I've got no recourse because right now I'm not home to move my trailer out. I feel so vulnerable. My girls are there. My wife is there, and I'm not there to help them. And, you know, they need God more than they need me. I know that. But I'm telling him, Lord, I am dependent upon you. Well, what, what about a time of peril? Has God abandoned us? No. Uh, what about sword? What if, what if you're put to death? Paul would eventually be put to death by the sword. When that happened, did Paul think to himself, well, I don't know if it's really the Christ. John the Baptist, Jesus' own cousin, you remember? After he was locked up in prison for quite some time, he sent apostle, or some of his disciples to Jesus and said, are, are you really he or do we look for another? Even John went through his own doubts. Jesus' cousin, his forerunner. Listen, you're going to go through doubts at times. But when you're in times of darkness, do, it's well said, do not doubt in the dark what God has revealed in the light. Have you ever heard that saying before? I mean, countless preachers have said that. Do not doubt in the dark what God has revealed in the light. He says here in verse 36, as it's written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Now that's a quote from Psalm 44:22. I wondered at first, why is verse 36 in this context? It, sounds, it kind of sounds out of place. Well, he just said, do any of these things, difficulties, stress, trials, famine, nakedness, peril, does any of that separate you from the Lord? And then he quotes from Psalm 44, for thy sake we're killed all the day long. In other words, the Lord had said, there are some of you that will be martyred for the faith. There are some of you that will suffer for the faith. But that doesn't mean God's abandoned you. That means he's working all things together for his good and uh, for his glory and for your good. Verse 37, he answers that. Nay, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, think about all the things that might separate you from the Lord. Um, wh whether you die or whether you live angels or these demonic forces, principalities, powers, um, no dimension, height, depth, no other creature is able to separate you from the love of Christ. And, and, and that ties into John 5, 24. I mentioned this in passing yesterday, but go back to John 5. We're going back to our text in a minute. But look at John 5, 24. Again, talking about the, the uh, truth of eternal security. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. Okay, notice, if you've believed on the Lord Jesus for salvation, the scripture says that person, you, hath, that's present tense, has, he has everlasting life. Well, if you used to have something, but you no longer have it, that would mean you lost it. And frankly, if you could lose everlasting life, how could it really be everlasting? It would be conditional. No, he further amplifies that by saying, this person who's saved is passed from death to life. I already mentioned, that's a one-time action that has ongoing ramifications. Okay, so my ring represents I got married May 22nd, 1993. Angela and I exchanged vows. People ask me, are you related to A.W. Tozer? I married her. Angela Westberg Tozer is my wife, okay? 
if I am related to the other AW too. But uh, so yeah, Angela Westberg is my wife. Well, now on May 22nd of 19, 1993, we got married. Our whole life has been affected by that decision since then. We have a mutual bank account, or bank accounts. Okay, we have uh, every vehicle we own is in both of our names. Our, we have three children together. Um, all of our dreams and plans and everything are wrapped up in each other. It was a one-time action, but it has literally affected the rest of my life. Okay, listen, God uses marriage as a picture of salvation. And when you become a child of God, he also used the picture of the bride of Christ. And you're literally wedded to him. And so once you're saved, he says, you'll never perish. Neither shall any man pluck you out of my hand. Now, some people say, well, if I believe like you Baptists believe, once saved, always saved, I'd go out and live like the devil. No, you wouldn't, because I know your father. Okay, now look, I knew my earthly father, and he didn't let us kids get away with wrong. My heavenly father was way more consistent than my earthly father was. And the Bible says of God, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. He disciplines them. He, he spanks them. He'll, he'll, uh, he'll correct them. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. There's... No gentle parenting with God, I'll tell you that. Uh, he knows how to whoop you when you have to be whooped. Uh, I've seen it in my own life. He is a benevolent father, but he will put the pressure on when it needs to be put on. And so the relationship is constant. Now, here's the issue, though. The relationship is constant, but fellowship is dependent. What do I mean by that? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Do Christians sin? Yeah, verse 8 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Verse 10 says, if we say we've not sinned, the truth is not in us. So if anybody says, oh, I don't sin anymore, 1 John 2 says, these things write I unto you that you sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So we can't say, I never sin. The problem is, when you sin, it severs your fellowship with God. So that's why my Bible teacher said, fess them when you do them, don't group them. All right, go back to, well, just let me quote 1 John 1, 9. You look at it. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Let me explain that word confess. It's a compound word. It comes from two words that mean to speak the same thing. Homo legeo. Homo, like our word uh, homosexual, homo sapien, homogenized, means the same. Uh, legeo comes from the word logic or uh, to think or to speak. So homo legeo means to speak the same thing. Confessing sin isn't just saying, oops, sorry God, messed up. No, that's not confessing sin. Confessing sin is calling it what God calls it. That look of lust was not, well, you know, sorry, Lord, I'm just a red-blooded male. No, it's sin. We've got to call it what God calls it. That angry word, well, I don't know what came over me. I mean, that's just not like me. Oh, no, it is like you. It's like me, too. We're depraved human beings apart from God. So when we do wrong, we don't just say, whoops, sorry, still working on that. That's not confessing. Confessing is saying to God, that lust or that anger or whatever it was, that was wrong. Lord, I'm sorry. That selfishness, that sin, and I'm sorry. So to remain. Now, so remain is to stay in fellowship. I was in uh, Bridgeport, West Virginia one time, and I was talking to the church about abiding in Christ. And and a man came and said, oh, I've got a good analogy. He said, when I was a kid, we lived by the railroad track. And he said, here in West Virginia, they're always hauling coal in the coal cars through the mountains. And he says, when you cross the trestle bridge, those, chain, those trains just shake back and forth. And all that coal dust falls down into piles under the trestle bridge. And he said, as a kid, we had a pile always down near our creek. And we'd go down under the trestle bridge, and we'd cl claw through all that stuff and climb on it and have fights, you know. And... He said, I'll go back to the house, and I am covered with coal dust head to toe. And uh, he said, you couldn't even recognize me. And I'd get back to the house, and my mother would say, and what do you think you're doing? He said, I'm home for supper. She said, you are always accepted at this house, but you are not always acceptable. You go out there and get the garden hose, you rinse off, and then you go up and you get a shower, and after the shower, you may come to the table. He said, that's a good analogy. Always accepted, but not always acceptable. He didn't get kicked out of the family because he was a dirty mess, but he wasn't welcome to the table till he got cleaned up. Okay, listen, when you get saved, you're forever saved. But are you staying in close fellowship with the Lord? 
By the way, it's not only a matter of what you don't do, like don't do the sin, but think about this. In a family, how do you maintain relationships within the family? Communication. Yeah. One of the hardest things for me this past year and a half, I've had to fly, and, you know, I, I spent a lot of time on the phone with my wife. And like most men, I'm not really, I don't love talking on the phone. My wife does. I can just put on speaker and listen for a while, and she's fine with that, you know. But uh, she's like a lot of you gals. You, a lot of women like to speak in fine print, and we men like the headlines, right? Um, I would rather be there in person and, you know, have the ability to look at her, hold her hand, and, you know, the whole package. But, uh, you know, right now I have to settle for the phone. It's not my favorite thing. But I'll tell you what, we talk every day. You know why? you got to communicate if you're going to maintain relationships. Okay, when do you let God talk to you? Well, I'm in church, am I not? It's amazing to me. Some people show up one time on Sunday morning and feel like, well, I gave God my, my what, your one hour, your hour and a half? There are 168 hours in the week. Let me ask you, how much of that time do you give to God? When you get to heaven, you think you're going to look back and say, well, I'm glad I gave God my one, one hour a week. What about the other hours of the week? Now I realize God made us to have to sleep. It's true. We, we sleep a third of our life away, a lot of us. That's, that's not sin. He gives his beloved sleep. But what do you do with your waking hours? It's so easy to say, well, I'll tell you, I'm a hard worker. And the Lord says, if any man will not work, neither should he eat. That's really true. He also said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And if you think about this, if he said that about physical, uh, if he said that about spiritual food, he said to us concerning Physical food, give us this day our what? Daily bread. That's talking about your meals, okay? Give us this day our daily bread. If you need physical food daily, and if he says man shall not live by bread alone, don't you think you might infer from that that he wants you to be in the word daily? If you need physical food daily, how much more do you need spiritual food daily? So how's your consumption of the Bible? How's your prayer life? So remain, it's a, talking about abiding in him. I mentioned the other night one of my uh, favorite books was written by uh, Ian Thomas called The Saving Life of Christ. He wrote a devotional book, a uh, companion to that, called The Indwelling Life of Christ. Saving, abiding, uh, same idea here. And, and listen to these words from The Indwelling Life of Christ by Ian Thomas. He said, to be entirely honest, I know of nothing quite so boring as Christianity without Christ. Countless people have stopped going to a place of worship simply because they're sick and tired of going through the motions of a dead religion. They're tired of trying to start a car on an empty tank. What a pity there are not more people around to show them that Jesus Christ is alive. Only Christ is capable of living the Christian life for the very obvious reason, the simple reason, that he is the Christian life. Do you know what it is to live purposefully? Living purposefully means trading our poverty for Christ's wealth, our weakness for Christ's strength. We, we exchange the bankruptcy of our fallen Adam for all the fullness of the life of Christ, the second Adam. Christianity is Christ. The Christian life is nothing less than the life which he lived then being lived now by him in you. That's well said. As I mentioned, the statement from his book, The Saving Life of Christ, so good. This one sentence, if you, if you wrote nothing else down, you ought to write this sentence down and think about it. The death of Jesus for you was to put the life of Jesus in you. That's worth remembering. The death of Jesus for you was to put the life of Jesus in you. Ian Thomas, I-A-N, Ian Thomas, British preacher, so well said. The death of Jesus for you was to put the life of Jesus in you. He said this in that book, to be in Christ, that is redemption. But for Christ to be in you, that's sanctification. To be in Christ, that makes you fit for heaven. But for Christ to be in you, that makes you fit for earth. To be in Christ, that changes your destination. But for Christ to be in you, that changes your destiny. The one makes heaven your home. The other makes this world his workshop. That's well said. I know you got to think about that. It'd be worth getting the book, The Saving Life of Christ. I have nothing to gain from it, but your spiritual benefit, but I would tell you it's a profitable read. So remain in him. You remember Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. 
The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let, let me bring it down to this. When my, my mom and dad realized we'd been going to church for years and we had this idea that, you know, hopefully uh, we do enough good that maybe our good would outweigh our bad. You know, use an old set of scales as a picture. And, and the idea of maybe if somehow we could do more good than bad, hopefully we'd get to heaven. Now, it's interesting. The Bible does not teach that. But that is taught by so many churches. And I will tell you, Paul said, if any man preach to you any other gospel than that which I have preached, let him be accursed. Well, do you know what the gospel was preached by Paul? He said, I declare to you the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He didn't say you can be good enough to be acceptable to God. He said you must be saved. Jesus said except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If you're trying to get to heaven being good, let me tell you something. You'll never get to heaven because you can't be good enough to get to heaven. So you have to literally receive him. Here, here's the summary statement. Christianity is not religion. It's a relationship with Christ. Now sometimes we've heard that Perhaps so often it can seem trite, can seem cliche, but let me tell you, that really is the underlying principle of all Christianity. Christianity is not religion. It is a relationship with Christ. Do you have that relationship? Have you been born again? You say, preacher, I, I do. Okay, so once you have the relationship, then the, deter the ter determinant goal, the end goal is to be in fellowship with him. You say, yeah, but I'm so prone to mess up. Uh-huh. Good thing God gave us Proverbs 24, 16. A just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Okay, a just man. Why? Well, I thought there was none righteous, no, not one. There's not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Who's a just man? He's one been made just by God. He's been justified by grace. But listen, he says a just man falls seven times. Okay, think with me. In the Bible, the number seven is the number of what? Perfection, completion. That guy must be a perfect failure. Complete catastrophe. He fell seven times. No, because he rises up again. See, that's where the concept of if we confess our sins. Once you've been born again, it doesn't mean you'll never sin. But I like this. Billy Sunday used to say this. If a hog and a sheep fall in a mud pit, the hog will wallow in that mud all day long. But the sheep will scurry out of the mud as fast as he can. Why? It's the nature of the hog to love the mud, but it's the nature of the sheep to despise it. If you're a child of God, you may fall in the mud, but you can't stay in the mud because you're the sheep of his pasture. Well said. And that brings us to the second R I want you to see. The first is to remain. But then number two is remove. Remove. Let's back up John 15 to verses 1 to 3. John 15, 1 through 3. I'm the true vine. My father's the husbandman. He's the vine dresser. He's the vineyard keeper. He's the farmer. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that he may bring forth more fruit. Now you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Okay, so these are some basic gardening or farming analogies. Um, you know the pruning of trees. I, I recently got a house down in Pensacola, Florida. I've never owned a house in my life. I'll be 58 next month, and I've never owned a house. We've lived in a fifth wheel our whole lives. I still haven't gotten in the house. We have a tenant in it until next month, so I've owned it for almost a year, but I haven't been in it. Well, one weekend, the tenant was away, and so we went over to do some yard work. It has some really beautiful crepe myrtle trees on the property, but it hadn't been shown much TLC. So one day, I went over there, and I've got my pruning shears, and I've got some other things to clip away, and... I'll tell you, I began to clip away and cut away, and boy, that tree looked beautiful. But we had a whole pile of stuff we had to take out and burn, okay, trimmings. And we had a burn barrel in the backyard we're allowed to use in Florida. So we took it out there, and it's a lot of cutting and pruning. The Lord has a way of doing that in our lives. If, if we're going to see move from fruit to more fruit, there's going to have to be pruning, have to be cutting away. Okay, what does, he, what does he remove in our lives? Verse 2, it's interesting. Um, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. 
Now, my, my spiritual gift is prophet. I, I don't mean I'm getting revelation from God. The Bible is complete. But the prophet is motivated by the message, thus saith the Lord, whatever God says. you know, The prophet tends to see things black and white. That's, a, that's not unusual for an evangelist to have that kind of spiritual gift. All right. So I'm, I'm the pretty much black and white, see it like it is kind of person. And uh, so that being the case, when I read this, every branch of me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. My thought is, that's right, they're not producing fruit. <laughs> God's ripping them out of the garden. <laughs> Get out of there. That's not exactly what that means. And when I heard a guy explain it, I thought, oh, he's a compromiser, that guy. Until I went back and did the study and found out, yeah, he's actually right. The takeaway here is not like to <laughs> rip it up and get rid of it. Notice it says every branch in me. Okay, they, they are in Christ. They have a relationship with him. If the branch is not bearing fruit, he takes it away. It literally means to lift up from the ground. Have any of you ever raised tomatoes? Okay, so Jersey is famous for tomatoes. And uh, my mom and dad used to raise tomatoes, and we had these big cages that we would use. And, you know, the idea is you get the vine going up there, and, man, you get these ripe red tomatoes. Uh, and I don't like raw tomatoes myself, but I like everything tomato-based. Now, my, the rest of my family all loves tomatoes, but I know a good tomato when I see it. What, when you got tomatoes lying on the ground, have you ever seen them where they were neglected and they're orange or half green, half orange, they're rotting? You know, you realize they need some tender, loving care. Okay, so if, if you've got your tomato plant, you get that thing with the cage around it or the stake, whatever you're using. Somewhere it can get up and spread out and get the sunlight. That's the idea of every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. It takes it away from the ground. In other words, to prop it up, that it may bring, more th that may bring forth fruit. And then those who are bearing some fruit, he purges them, like pruning, so they can bring forth more fruit. You know what that tells me? That Christians will show evidence of their salvation through fruit. And Christians do not continue in sin. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Um, for sake of time, I'll only give you the text, but you might jot down Romans 6, 1 through 14. Uh, I remember it's the first chapter of the Bible I ever memorized was Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? It goes on to say, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves to God as those that are alive from the dead. For sin shall not have dominion over you. You're not under the law, but under grace. Okay, so I fast forward. I went from the beginning of 1 to 14 there. My, I had a teacher that taught us, you want to personalize that scripture when you say it. So what, what are you struggling with? So as a teenager, you know, I'm... When I first uh, started going to church, I had, been, I had not been raised in a, in, a, um, in a Bible preaching church, and I would use bad words. I mean, probably stuff that's not considered horrible nowadays, but it's bad words, right? And so I'm in youth group, and I'm getting convicted. I'm, I'm using some four-letter words that I sure shouldn't be using. And God's working in my heart, and I think, oh, I've got to stop that. Well, how, how, do you, how do you do that? So I remember taking Romans 6. What shall I, Rich Tozer, say? Shall I continue in cursing that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall I, rich, who am dead to sin, live any longer in cursing? Personalize it. And that's how you see God begin to give you victory. So if it's lustful thoughts, pornography, uh, anger, selfishness, uh, whatever it is, putting, uh, putting your interest above God, you know, that's idolatry. Make it personal. Take the scripture and, okay, shall I continue in this? No, God forbid. So you've got to remove the sin from your life. Now, I would give you some encouragement to jot down Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, which tells us that we put away, put off the old man, which is corrupt, according to the deceitful lust. Be, ren um, be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Okay, there's a three-step principle there. Put off, be renewed, put on. It's just like if you came out of the field and you've been working and you're sweating, you know, and you've got, oh, man, you're all hot around the collar and you're just like, oh. Okay, what do you do? You're sweaty and it's time to go out for a meal or what? Well, first thing you do is you take off the dirty clothes. 
But before you put on a clean outfit, what would you do after you put off the dirty clothes? Get a shower, get a bath. So you put off the dirty clothes, then you get washed up, and then you put on the new. That's the principle, Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. Put off, be renewed, put on. So you put off. Okay, so I was at one time addicted to music like ACDC, Van Halen, Led Zeppelin, okay? And my music was all about sex, drugs, and rebellion. And uh, I didn't know... I, the morality of music when I first started going to church. So I'm in youth group and I'm getting convicted about the kind of stuff I'm addicted to. So what do I do? Well, I remember the night I broke up all the records and we burned it in the backyard in a burn barrel, right? Well, for two weeks, I didn't listen to anything except news. KYW News Radio 1060, Philadelphia. That got depressing. And, uh, you know, Philly's lost again and there was corruption in the mayor's office and SEPTA wasn't working and whatever. Man, that was a downer. So I thought, oh, I got to have some music. So I, I thought, well, if I just get one rock tape, I'd broken up hundreds of dollars worth of records. So I thought, if I just have one, the Holy Spirit convicted me. If you go back to that, you're just going to be enslaved in it again. Oh, I know. So see, I'd put off. Well, now God was working on me to renew my mind. And then what I did is I put on godly music. I began to listen to the kind of music we listen to in church, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. I didn't have an appetite for that at first. I respected it. I just didn't have an appetite for it. But as I began to listen to it, I got an appetite for it. And I'll tell you, within weeks, I didn't miss the old stuff, and I had desires for the new stuff. That's the principle of put off, renew, put on. I can't abide in Christ. I can't have fellowship with him if I'm constantly going back to sin. So you remain in him. You fellowship. You remove the sin from your life. And then finally... The third R is reproduce. Reproduce. Okay, now let me go to verse 8, John 15, verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Go, go back to verse 2 a minute. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, and they may, may bring forth more fruit. And then look at... Um, Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. God's intention for you and me is to bear fruit. Okay, what kind of fruit are we talking about? Well, the, the fruit of a Christian is other Christians. You say, I thought it's love, joy, peace. Well, that's the fruit of the Spirit. That should be seen in your life as well. The character of a Christian is born by the Spirit of God in him. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. He names nine characteristics there. Do you see those evident in your life? But then think about this. Well, the fruit of an apple tree is apples, and the fruit of a grapevine is grapes, and the fruit of an orange tree is oranges. Okay, and the fruit of a tomato plant is tomatoes. What's the fruit of a Christian? should be other Christians. So... Look at John 7, verses 38 to 39. Back up to John 7 for a minute. John 7, 38 to 39. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay, remember in John 14, 12, he said, you'll do greater works than these because I go to my Father. When he went to the Father, that's when the Spirit of God came. So close tonight in Galatians chapter 6, if you will. Galatians 6. And look at verses 7 to 9. Galatians 6. Now, if we're going to abide in Christ, we're going to bear fruit. And the fruit of Christians is other Christians. Oh, I forgot. I had an analogy here I wanted to give you. Talk about why it's important to remove sin from your life. Uh, I know this is kind of far away. Any of you know what this is? I brought this from Florida with me. Okay, this is a brake line. Okay, and it came off my trailer. And um, the reason it came off my trailer, it, it's in the permanent archives as a sermon illustration. Because if you see that end there, Pastor, you see that thing got flattened. I was traveling through West Virginia one day, and I have this little gauge on my dashboard that tells me the, the uh, temperature pressure of my tire. I'm sorry, the, the uh, pounds per square inch on my tires and the temperature of all my tires. And all of a sudden, it was going beep, 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 beep. So I pulled over the road immediately. It was the back tire on the door, on the passenger side, the door side of my trailer. I rushed back there. The thing's on fire. So I grabbed the fire extinguisher, 
put it out. Well, what had happened was this brake line had, had slid up above the axle because it is only zip tied on there. It had come above the axle, I guess it was on this side. And uh, what had happened was the, the wheel had come up and slammed against it and pinched it against the frame. The axle pinched against the frame and literally sealed this off. Well, the way brake lines work, you've got to have brake fluid running through here. That operates the hydraulic calipers of your, of your brakes. So, you know, either open it or close it with the fluid running through. The problem is once the fluid got pinched off, now they're stuck in a closed position. So now you've got friction. Friction generates heat. Heat caused the fire. So it's all cause and effect, right? So you know what I had to do? I had to cut this brake line off, had to go to Napa, had to get another brake line, and had to install it, and then had to make sure we had enough brake fluid back and all that, bleed out the brakes, etc. So there was a process to get the brakes working again. Now, when there's brake fluid flowing through there, those brakes work effortlessly. All you do is push the pedal. Okay, abiding in Christ is not letting anything hinder his flow through us, his working through us. So you remove the sin from your life. Well, then you see the fruit in your life. So we close with this, Galatians 6, look at verses 7 to 9. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Okay, so you know the law of sowing and reaping. You reap what you sow. I mean, if you plant corn seeds, you're not going to grow apple trees, right? You reap what you sow. Okay, so in your life, if you're sowing sinful life, you're not going to reap spiritual fruit. Pretty simple, right? But what caught my attention is in verse 8 where he says, he that sows to his flesh will the flesh reap corruption. We got that, you know. Why are, you know, venereal diseases, sexually transmitted diseases so prevalent in our society? Because of lifestyles. This is the way people live. Why is cirrhosis of the liver so common in America? Because drinking is so prevalent, you know? I mean, there are a lot of cause and effects, okay? Why, why do people have, fry their brains? Uh, drug use is so common, okay? There are a lot of cause and effects. You sow to the flesh, you reap corruption. But notice it says this, you sow to the spirit, you'll have the spirit reap life everlasting. Well, it almost sounds like, well, if you live a spiritual life, then you end up getting to go to heaven when you die. Well, we know that's not the case. You don't, you don't earn life everlasting. What does he mean here, you sow to the Spirit, you'll reap life everlasting? Not your own spiritual life. You'll be used of the Lord to see other people come to everlasting life. Because the fruit of a Christian is other Christians. You say, well, I, I don't always see people saved when I witness to them. Well, how, do you witness to them? Remember Paul said, one plants and other waters, but in the end, who gives the increase? God. So it's not that I win people to the Lord. No, he does that. But my job is to sow. My job is to water. Sometimes I get to reap. But either way, I'm to be involved in the whole process. But you will of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So I've got an analogy here. This is a work glove. And I want you to think about this. Um, you know, this is a leather work glove, so this one's not cheap. Now, when, when I first got this work glove, let me put that there for a minute. Just, just watch that for five seconds, okay? It's amazing how long five seconds is, isn't it? Okay. What happened during that five seconds? Nothing. I thought about taking this back. I mean, it's a work glove, and it does nothing. <laughs> well, you know why. Because without the hand, the glove does nothing. Follow this. As the hand is to the glove, so Christ is to the Christian. Without me, you can do nothing. But I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. The whole idea of abiding in him is we are saved by his grace, and then we're empowered by His grace. We're made fruitful by His grace. So we have to remain in fellowship. Fest them when you do them. Don't group them. Communicate with Him. And then remove sin from your life when it crops up, just like weeding, weeding the garden or pruning trees. And then by the grace of God, you reproduce. That's what it means. 
to abide in Christ. You've listened great. Let's bow our heads. Thank you for listening. And I'm praying that God will help us to put into practice what we're hearing from his word. Well, Lord, I'm grateful for the analogies of Scripture. They help me. The pictures help me understand. But I know this. If the Spirit of God's not our teacher, we're not going to be changed by the truth. We'll just hear it. And I, I don't want that. I want us to be changed by the truth. So, dear Holy Spirit, I am fully dependent upon you. Would you please work in us so you can work through us and that you might bear fruit through us? Our heads are bowed. I want to ask you this. How many of you can give testimony?